Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Mark Cooper. He is the owner of coopersvintagedrums.com, which is an unbelievable resource for all things drum history. Mark, how are you? I'm great, Bart. How are you doing? I'm good, man. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you because, uh, like I said to you before, I use your website all the time as a reference. Um, I've talked about it a thousand times on the show, and, and, uh, and I just look at it for fun just because you, um, you have the best historical just knowledge and photos and things I can't seem to find anywhere else. So it's a, it's a great resource. Well, thank you very much for saying that. that that's so nice to hear. Uh, I always love hearing when people are referencing using my uh, website as a reference, a historical reference, and it makes made all the work I put into it worthwhile. So you've got Slingerland, you've got Kent, you've got World War II drums, you have your own collection. It, it is awesome. I recommend everyone checks it out. Thank you. Today, though, we are talking particularly about Slingerland, which is such a classic drum brand, and they they don't really exist anymore. Well, they kind of do, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but... Yeah, so why don't we just start, um, per usual, let's just start back at the beginning of the company, and um, we'll run through the history. I've got your website open here as a reference, and uh, anyone listening along, I recommend doing that too, because you can see a lot of cool pictures um, that, that follow what we're talking about. So, Mark, I'll let you take it away, man. Why don't you start at the beginning of uh, Slingerland? Sure. Um, the Slingerland Banjo Company was the original name. And they got off the ground somewhere around 1923. And it was formed by members of the Slingerland family in Chicago. And at that time, all they were making was uh, guitars, ukuleles, banjos, and some various other uh, instruments of that type, but not drums. They didn't begin their drum production until around 1926. And they ended up buying out the Liberty Musical Instrument Company that was going out of business. And they bought all of their... Uh, drum making equipment and machines and uh, everything else that goes along with that. And I think the way they got into uh, making drums, as, in addition to banjos, was the Ludwig and Ludwig Company in the same city of Chicago. Initially, they were a drum manufacturer, and then they started dabbling in banjo making. And I guess Slingerland went, hey, wait a minute, you're going to do that, then we're going to make drums. And uh, that's kind of how that took off. Hmm. And wow. they, by, by, 19, by 1920. Uh, I'd say 1927, I guess, they became the Slingerland Banjo and Drum Company. Now, I always think it's really interesting that banjos were so popular at this point in time because it's, it's, uh, banjos are obviously around now and people love them, but that was the big instrument at, uh, at that point in time, which I think is just a cool, you know, just puts you in that, that time frame there. Yeah, uh, the banjos were different than they are today. They were more uh, strummed as opposed to the picking, like you see uh, in you know modern, more modern day banjo players. And uh, it was from that jazz era. Mm. You know, you see you, know, you see the, the flappers and the the ragtime music, and uh, the banjo was hugely popular for a while. Yeah, that music it kind of has that uh, tinny sound to it, so it lends itself to yeah. um, that that kind of an instrument. And it's probably not too huge of a departure having a a head on it. It has a drum head on the, or I guess it's a banjo head on there. So, um, kind of makes sense. Yeah. It's sort of a logical, illogical, uh, uh, association. You know? Yeah. Cause like you said, it is, it's basically a drum with a guitar neck on it. Yeah. And then you throw some, uh, spite in there against, uh, Ludwig and Ludwig and you've got a drum company. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cool. A banjo and drum company. Yeah. All right. So they, uh, so they have entered the drum making world in around 1927, right? Yeah, they, they bought out Liberty Company uh, in 26, and it's a little sketchy on how long it actually took from the time they bought them out to when they started actually producing drums. But uh, de- definitely by 1927, 28, uh, they were going strong with drum making. Okay, cool. All right, so then we enter the 30s, right? They're, they are definitely known for being a pretty major company in this, in this period. Yes, definitely. And uh, they lost no time in producing some really beautiful instruments. Uh, one of their, their flagship at the time, uh, flagship drum at the time, was called a tone flange artist model. And, and if anyone's if not familiar with what a tone flange is, uh, this goes back to the banjo making uh, thing. It, it was sort of borrowed from banjo technology. And what it was, 
uh, they took a, a, a regular snare drum with a flat edge, a uh, bearing edge, as opposed to you know a normal edge, and they would put this thing that looked like a hubcap on top, and it rested on several screws, uh, kind of floated on them, and it was designed to take out unwanted tones, uh, give you more range, and uh, cut the ring out of the, uh, the drum, hmm. basically kind of de- deadened it. And yeah. uh, that was there. That was there was a big push from, from the company on this drum, and and it wasn't real popular. It, it didn't last too long. Uh, by 1934, 1935, they were starting to do away with the tone flange uh, in favor of just more standardized uh, drums. Well, it's it's definitely um, progressive, and I think that's something worth noting. It's just the uh, progressiveness of. Slingerland. Um, I did read early on in doing these episodes. I read the Slingerland book um, uh, by Rob Cook, and um, it seemed like great, time, great time. Book. Yes, it seemed time after time like they were just pushing the envelope, and mixed with obviously with Gene Krupa making things. Um, you know, if it didn't work out, it didn't work out. But but they tried it, so I think that's um, that's pretty cool. They're they're definitely ahead of their time with that. Yeah, definitely. And like I said, it just, unfortunately, it really didn't catch on. Uh, it didn't really do what they claimed it would do as far as making it sound like a machine gun or uh, give you extra pop hmm. and, all, and all that kind of uh, color, all the colorful descriptions they used. Yeah, I'm looking at that right now. It rejuvenates and clarifies the tone and staccato notes pop out like the crack of a machine gun. That's a pretty good description. It's a pretty big, pretty bold claim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Considering it, it, it really kind of flopped. I mean, yeah. it, it, they made a lot of them, and a lot of them were sold. But I think people, like I said, by around 1934, 35, 30, definitely by 36, they were just, no thanks. Yeah, okay. So they learned from that, and then in the 30s, they just kind of, they lose that, and they move on to just your standard drum with a, the reinforcement ring, right? Yes, exactly. And, and at that time, they were making them out of, uh, usually out of solid walnut, or solid mahogany, and cool. just a single ply. Although there are a few, few oddball drums that I've come across that were actually two ply and even and three ply before they were really doing that. Uh, hmm. But yeah, mainly it was mainly they were going with a single ply uh, drum, and they switched over to maple, solid maple, which is what Slingerland and Slingerland Radio Kings are known for, uh, solid maple shells. That's they kind of moved towards that around nineteen. Ooh, 33, I think. Okay. Side note there, Radio King is kind of their flagship, their their most famous model, right? That's what Gene yeah, was playing. Yeah. That's what the, the big names were using. Exactly. There, there wasn't a whole lot of difference but from one company to the other at, at that time until they came out with the Radio King line. And uh, it wasn't really a, a, a departure from, from what the other companies were doing, but because of the Gene Krupa Association, uh, it just the Radio King name uh, just became legendary, and everybody wanted a Radio King set. Yeah, uh, you know, in the, starting in the in the mid '30s. Now, so what you just said though is there was not too big of a difference with that and pre Radio King or other drums. It was just almost more that like, let's just it's just branding. It's really good branding that that made people want it. Yeah, yeah definitely, and. and Prior to the Radio King line, the drums kind of, uh, they all kind of looked alike from one company to the other. Mm -hmm. Well, with the exception of Leedy, that's kind of a different story. But, you know, the the big two at the time were Ludwig, Ludwig and Ludwig and Slingerland. And they were all using the tubular lugs, which really looked identical. And, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of difference. And then in 1936, 37, when the Radio King line came out, they uh, came up with a lug design, an actual uh, actually, a non-tubular uh, lug design, and that gave it a gave them a distinctive look. That's really the only. I mean, for a lot of drums, that's the best way. Minus the badge, that's the way you can tell them apart. Really. Yeah, exactly. And you know, prior to that, they they really kind of did look alike. They were using what you would talk to, uh, today you call generic looking, you know, hardware. Yeah. Well, let me let me pause you for a sec because. Before we move on, again, I'm following along on your website here. Uh, what one thing I know nothing about, and I'm really interested in, is the the use of the term "black beauty" um, as far as the snares, and they have the black beauty and white beauty outfits, the artist model. Um, what's the deal with that? 
the the black beauty uh, actually they coined the term black beauty from what i understand from my research it, it they were the first company to use that name hmm. uh and that would have been around oh yeah 1928 um when their first catalog came out um that they were pushing the the black beauty drums uh quite heavily at the time which was a a black nickel shell with uh, hand engraved uh designs on the shell hmm. and what they what was known as art gold hardware and what what it what that was uh it was an imitation gold plating and it it started with the hardware was copper plated followed by a gold lacquer and it uh, gave it sort of a uh, it was an imitation gold finish and every all the company all the other companies were doing the same thing but they just had different names for it and people get them confused uh Slingerland called it art gold uh Ludwig and Ludwig called it deluxe and Lady yeah. Lady called theirs knobby gold hmm. I like Another art gold name that, yeah yeah, I do too. I think that's the best. It's just cool because, I mean, obviously when people think of Black Beauty, they think of Ludwig. And you look at it, and if you didn't see Slingerland, like it was turned around or something, you would think that that was a, you know, without knowing with, you know, if you know more about the lugs and stuff. But it looks very much um, in that same vein. Now, did did Ludwig kind of borrow that idea from uh, from Slingerland? I think it may have just happened organically. Okay. I, I I think they all, uh, because that was, you know, that type of plating was being used on other things, uh, you know, guns. You gotcha. Know. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I think it was just a logical thing. They all went for like a fancy, uh, you know, engraved look. The one distinctive thing about the Slingerland drums at that time, the Black Beauties and, and the other uh, lines like the Artist Model, they had a double flanged hoop. Uh, as opposed to the single flange that everyone else was using, and they but they used uh, rim clips to hold it on, so it gave it a distinctive look. It gave it that extra flange that would hide the the uh, flesh hoop of the drum head. Yeah, it's it's a. I mean, what did do you know? What well, I guess I, we can see right here on um, that this would be you know for the whole drum set in that period that was like a hundred twenty dollars. So that's. Uh, that was a long time ago, so that's that's a, a lot of money, but that's that's not bad for something now that's extremely valuable. Yeah, I'm not sure what the uh, what that amount of money would be to, in today's uh, economy, uh, but I think 120 dollars was, was fairly expensive. Oh yeah, at the time. Okay, so um, obviously we are. If this is 1930, 1929, we are in the Great Depression. So I'm not sure how many people are buying these. Um, Black Beauty kits and all that stuff. Now, was the company pretty? Uh, were they hit pretty hard in the depression, or did they seem to uh, seem to do okay? Well, I'm sure they were. Although it's sort of the sort of the case that um, during bad times, people uh, use music to uh, kind of get them through. And, and I, I think you know bands were still very popular, even though you know uh, the economy was so bad, and people were suffering. Music and bands still were thriving, yeah. And so, I'm sure had that not happened, uh, they would have been really, really uh, going strong. Yeah, and it's uh, it seems it's always good to note that I think to reiterate that Gene Krupa is just their guy. So he's he's obviously at this point one of the most popular drummers in the country in the world, and he is till the day he died, he is a Slingerland guy. Um, so that's, oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. That's gotta definitely. be, you know, a great endorsement for them. Um, so yeah, we're in the thirties. Any, anything else big happening then? Uh, unfortunately for Slingerland, they, um, at the time L Ludwig and Ludwig had a, a drum called the, uh, super Ludwig, which had extended snares and was controlled from both sides. It was, you know, it's still made today that, that, you know, that basic design is still around today. And so Slingerland decided to come out with something called a do-all model. It was called do-all radio model. And it was pretty much borrowed from uh, Ludwig's uh, super sensitive mechanism. And only theirs was really, really complicated. Hmm. You know, multiple small parts, little springs, just over, totally over-designed. And, it was only around for about a year or a year and a half. And the story goes that Slingerland, uh, I mean, Ludwig and Ludwig 
didn't like the fact that it was really similar to theirs, so they sent them a cease and desist uh, notif- notification to stop making these drums that are a little bit too much like theirs. Wow. And so that, as a result, there's very few of those around. Um, I've had several pass through my hands. Uh, and the same with the, the Slingerland Black Beauty. To date, only about 16 of them, I think, have been found. Wow. Which That's... is a pretty small number. Oh, my God, you know, yeah. Pretty small number. Considering they were available for quite a while, but it goes back to what you were saying about the the depression, who had the money for something like that? Yeah, and, and the same with the do all. It was pretty. It was sixty dollars at the time for one, which is big money in in uh, nineteen thirty three. Yeah, absolutely. But, but again, that it, but again, that drum only lasted until thirty four, and then it was gone. Well, um, that's a testament to if you find one of these, then, you know, you that's the holy grail of uh, of drums. Um, this seems like a time where people were experimenting a lot with these different snare techniques and the super sensitive and, and I guess later on getting into like the Dynasonic and these, these like interesting techniques for operating a snare drum. Sure. And it, and it was one of the only things that set one company apart from another. So there was uh, a lot of focus on basically building a better mousetrap, um, yeah. coming up with a distinctive design that, you know, to compete. And it got a little crazy with some of these where they were just over designing them. And, uh, eventually they went, it kind of went backwards. They started going towards the more, uh, simple design. Yeah. And that think that also was happening, um, with the tuning, obviously with people trying to get the, um, Joe Meckler talked about it a lot with the uh, the single tuning kind of, uh, you know, one knob to tune the whole drum, which obviously time after time kind of just didn't didn't work out. So definitely a lot of experimenting going on. Yeah, there was a company called uh, L&S, Leedy and Stroop, uh, around that same, same time, maybe a little later, and they had this crazy uh, design of internal tuning. And it, it was cables uh, going from interior cables going from one lug to another to another, and you would turn tune it from the outside, and it would push up against the, the drum heads. And uh, hmm. again, everyone was trying to come up with something different. It, they were great concepts, and, and it's been tried all the way up into the to the early '50s with with Levy and Ludwig and their their uh, ill fated knob tension line. Mm-hmm. A great concept, but they didn't have the uh, mechanical ability i guess or to to make it to where it was a nice solid working concept and you know things broke things fell apart and and drummers drummers are, are i'm speaking for myself are basically simple people <laughs> and <laughs> yeah and and so they tend to shy away from uh from things like that uh, it's just you know too complicated too much uh, you know prone to breakage not for me yeah Exactly. I mean, when you take a drum apart, like as opposed to fixing like an amp or a guitar or something, it's it's lugs, tension rods, rims in the shell, and the the snares and stuff. It's it's not it's it's relatively right. simple for us for us simple yeah, people. Yeah, you, you take a you take a do all apart, and you got to be careful. You're dealing with like forty small pieces and little springs. You make one false move, and, and you've you've destroyed this. Yeah, uh, I, I've. I've actually never even worked on one. I, I, I always shied away. I've had a few, and it's like, no, I'm not getting into this. I, I'll no. let someone else work on it. <laughs> yeah. my, my, my fingers are too big to handle those small parts. No, it's impractical. And uh, But they obviously they experimented, and I think other companies kind of learned from their mistakes and maybe, uh, you know, again, they're, they're, they're pioneers, um, especially in this – this kind of thirties era, um, and the finishes. I just love, I always love looking on your website. I love the sea green pearl. Um, that is one of my favorites. Um, they have tons of cool finishes at this point. Um, they don't seem like they're, uh, scared to try things and, and, and get out there with the, the cool finishes. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Uh, there were some crazy looking finishes back then. Uh, and, and when I say crazy, I mean, crazy, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and and sea green pearl that's always been my my favorite too. I've got several sets and uh, snare drums in that finish, and as well as a ban- I have a Slingerland banjo and it's just dripping in sea green pearl. It's beautiful. <laughs> that's so cool to see the banjo with the same finish next to the drums. I mean, it's just like 
that is a collector's uh, collector's dream there. Yeah, yeah. There's something about that green finish. Uh, when I first got into vintage drums back in the early 80s, uh, I was reading Modern Drummer, and they had a, a, a spe- uh, an article on vintage drums from, from the 20s and 30s and 40s, and they had a picture, although it was in black and white, I, I was able to use my imagination, but it was a, a 1930s artist model, Slingerland in sea green pearl. And ever since I saw that, I just dreamed of finding one someday. And it wasn't until uh, maybe about 10 years ago that I, I was able to locate some. And so it's just always been my favorite. It has some sort of mystique to it. Yeah, it does. And I know... Um... I don't know if this is your kit, but on, on your website, there's a full kit here, which um, we should touch on the, um, the in 1934, you say that's when they first introduced tunable toms. Um, so I think it's a cool thing to talk about how before that toms weren't tunable. You were just basically, you know, at the whim of the temperature and all this kind of things, at least the bottom heads and they were the tack heads. So, um, I mean, that's huge. That's, that's revolutionary. Yeah, it really was, and uh, because, like you said, you were at the mercy of, of old man weather, and the, the heads, a lot of the tom toms were tacked on top and bottom, and even the ones that had one head where you could tune it, it's still that bottom head would get would get real loose, and if I can I, I can't imagine the nightmare it would have been to be playing outdoors near the ocean, yeah, with uh, with tacked on heads and, and no ability. Uh, to, to, to tighten them up, and which is why uh, they a lot of drummers had internal heating units yeah. or light bulbs inside there that would uh, dry them out enough to keep a even tension on top and bottom. But uh, not everyone had those, so I can't I can imagine it would have been rough. Gosh, yeah. The first time I saw that internal light bulb, I actually I think I posted something and I said, "Hey, cool, they got a light bulb." Because now you see that and you go, "Cool, that's a it's a it's a showy thing." It's like it's like a, there's light in here. It, it looks cool. And, uh, someone actually commented and said, Hey, no, that's actually to, um, to heat up the, um, the heads and to, to make it so the temperature wasn't, uh, fluctuating. And it's just, it's wild. It had a dual purpose. Uh, it was for show. It, it would flash behind a painted, you know, the, the painted scenes yeah. on the front heads were real popular back then. And then, so you have the backlighting inside and it would just give a great look to it. But, it, but, at the same time, it was keeping those heads taut. Hmm. So you're saying I was partially right. I'm I'm not wrong. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's all that matters. Um, you're not wrong. That's good. That's a first. Um, so I've, I have a. Uh, uh, you may have seen it. I have a, a Gretsch uh, Sea Green Pearl drum set, and it has a painted head on the front of a windmill. Cool. Yeah. And inside, it's got three color three colored bulbs that alternate when you turn it on. And it's, it's really cool. And wow. it, again, it, it kept those heads dry, man. Uh, so, all right, two questions here on, while we're on heads. Um, first one, how, I don't know anything about like the actual tack heads. How do you change those? Do you get like a, like a, like pliers and pull out each tack or do you just, how, I mean, how does that work? Yes. Yeah. You, uh, they have to be, all pulled out individually and each drum has, oh I don't know, like gosh. 40 of them or something at least. Wow. And yeah, you have to pull them all. Say it broke. You know, if you, if it broke, you'd have to have the whole thing retacked. And the, the heads were thicker. They weren't calf heads. Uh, they went for uh, either goat. I think it was basically goat or pig skin. Hmm. And uh, that gave it a little bit of durability, but still, um, I, they still would get sloppy in you know in humid weather and yeah and if you broke one then you, yeah you'd have to take it to the drum shop and have somebody you know redo all the tacks for you wow and then you think of retacking in the same place of it kind of like wearing out that uh, hole that the tack was in yes yeah it's a nightmare I've, I've tried it and i've never been very successful at it uh mm. in that one drum set you referenced this, the green pearl set with the uh, 13 inch Tom has tacked heads on both, uh, both top and bottom. Yeah. Uh, I actually had to send, send that to, uh, a guy named Jack Lawton, who's famous for his incredible restoration work over the years. And he was able to do, uh, do it for him. He did a beautiful job too. Jeez. I don't envy that. But, I mean, it's but don't try it at home. Don't try it at home. <laughs> no, on your 1934 Slinger lens, let, let someone else do it. 
Um, second question while we're on heads is you mentioned, and I've recently um, – through your website and through uh, some other resources, been just fascinated by um, the painted scenes on the bass drum heads. It's just right. such a cool, uh, just like moment in time where that was happening. Um, what what's up with that? I mean, were, the, were these they were all hand painted? Obviously, you're not screen printing back in the day. Oh no! Each company each company had an artist, an in house artist that would basically sit at a not a conveyor belt, but one after another would come by and he'd, he'd uh, do a whole painting and then the next one would come, he'd do another one. And they had several designs. They, um, I mean, every company had several really cool designs. Uh, some were silhouette, just black and white, and mm. others were full color. Uh, the, the craziest one I've ever seen was a forest fire. Uh, a friend of mine has a, a photograph of that. No one knows who owns the drum now. It was on eBay like 15 years ago. Wow. And, uh, so I think somebody in Europe may have bought it. But again, it had the internal light, so it's, it's just oh, cool. so crazy looking. Yeah, it lit up the flames, and it, it's a it was a like a log cabin on fire in the woods. It's kind of a grim, yeah. uh, sad. Photo. Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> wow, cool. So yeah. each individual one is hand painted, so they they have to be slightly different one after the yeah. other. Cool. Yeah, definitely, and some have. Um, the company logo on them and some don't some artists were way better than others in fact slingerland's painted heads compared to the other companies they weren't that good the uh the they were more of a i hate to say it, like a b-grade artist was doing them hmm. and uh there was one in particular i had of a it's like a, a lake scene with a cabin or something and it just look like I painted it, you know, it just wasn't, <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. just wasn't that great. And then you see Ludwig's and, and Leedy's and they're like spectacular. So I guess they maybe had higher paid artists or something, but yeah. Wow. That's a whole, I'd love to do an episode on, on that, just on those, um, those people. I think if there, you know, if there's enough information, that would be really cool. Um, yeah, I, I've only seen one or two photos of, of an artist in the factory actually painting the heads. Yeah, I've got one. I found uh, on uh, I think I think his name's Sam Bennett. He posts a bunch of cool photos, and I I found one that I'll, I'll send to you. And you probably already have already seen it, but um, it's awesome. There were a lot a, a lot of people did their own too to save the money. They would you know find a friend or their mom or something that was a painter and wow. copy the scenes. And you can always tell the original from the from the copied one. <laughs> yeah, from the the kid who's doing it himself. Um, one thing that's cool too at this point is. Um, just looking at these 30s style drum sets, the hardware, the floor tom is not mounted with legs. It's got sort of like a cradle that the drum is sitting in, which you, you just don't see that very often, obviously, with what we're used to. Right. And it's, it's funny. I mean, in retrospect, you think, well, why would they use something like that? Why didn't they use legs? And it wasn't until uh, certain uh, different companies at different times uh, introduced legs. Levy was, if I recall, was the first company to put legs on. And that was in the, I think the mid thirties, maybe mid or mid to late thirties. And Slingerland oddly didn't do it until after the war. Uh, 1947 was the first time that legs were used on floor toms uh, with the Slingerland company. Wow. And it's just odd that they waited that long. Yeah. Yeah. You take for granted, no, like thinking there's legs on there, but, um, yeah, I, I think there was an aversion to drilling into a drum. Yeah, uh, unlike today, you know, where they put, you know, they, they'll drill giant holes and things. Yeah, I think they were. If you look, all the, they they tried everything they could not to uh, drill into the drum. Uh, you see, like the little, even going back to the Chinese toms of the of the twenties and early thirties, they had weird little uh, holders that clamped onto the bass drum and just sort of held the tom in place. But you know, nothing was really, yeah. You know, there would maybe be one eye hook or something screwed into the into the shell, and that would be it. So the same with same with bass drums. They didn't want to put drill leg drilling for legs, so they had uh, they attached them to the hoops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of uh, the hoop mounted accessories, which um, to this day, obviously, you still see that people want the virgin bass drum. But um, it's cool. It's it's just so cool to see how things have translated and what has stuck around versus what has gone away. Um, and I, th I think definitely uh, that as music changed, 
and drumming became more aggressive, uh, maybe with harder playing to a point. Uh, the the drums the drum sets uh, progressed along with the music and the demand for sturdier hardware and yeah. drums that you could tune. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's cool. Okay, so moving forward here. So that is obviously the 30s. There's tons of cool stuff there. Um, as we get closer to the 40s... Um, yeah. Well, let's let's not skip the, 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 the uh, final chapter in the 30s for Slingerland. Sure. Uh, they, they came up when, when the uh, do-all flopped and they, they were forced to, you know, or encouraged to, to stop making them. They came out with a drum called the Broadcaster, and they had full lugs, which which you would see on the Radio Kings later, and which is this launched the Radio King uh, drum, and that's basically what they were. Hmm. And once again, they they had uh, the Broadcaster was around for a couple of years until uh, Gretsch noticed it, and Gretsch had been using the term Broadcaster since 1928. Yeah. And so they said, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, you can't." Even though it was, uh, even though Gretsch spelled it with a K, with a K broadcaster, yeah, wow. yeah, it was still too close to their spelling, so they, yeah. they had to drop that. And then that's when the Radio King line was born. Hmm. Interesting. And and it's on on that note. In the previous episode, we uh, no two episodes ago, we were talking about uh, Gretsch. And I asked, why broadcaster? Why? And then it's like, why Radio King? And it's it's really, if correct me if I'm wrong, but it's because of just the popularity of the radio, of radio and broadcasting and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Cool. Exactly, yes. So that was pretty revolutionary. That's obviously what their uh, their their famous uh, drum line and, and what Gene would always play. Yeah, and Gene actually played a broadcaster, um, uh, I guess that would be 1935, and uh, Brooks Tegler, who's a uh, uh, total expert on Gene Krupa, pointed that out to me that uh, Gene's first drum wasn't a radio king, even though it looked identical, you know, from a few feet away, but it was actually uh, a broadcaster. Wow. That's interesting. It's kind of like that pre, uh, lawsuit, you could call it like, uh, before they yeah. got sued kind of thing. Wow. <laughs> right. And all that stuff, the legality, uh, the legal issues, it's, there's not much information on that. So, uh, some of it's speculation, uh, some of it's rumor, uh, but there's been enough of it to suggest that this these things did happen. That you know, maybe it wasn't formally, you know, it wasn't a formal uh, cease and desist order through a, through a court. But it was, you know, back then people did things differently. And they maybe call the, the one company would call the other. Go, what are you doing? You can't do this. Yeah, stop. Well, I know. Um, yeah, right. With the Zildjian stuff, Gretsch wasn't like shy about getting into. Uh, lawsuits and um and things like that but but yeah i'm sure that's pretty blatant like uh hey you're using our name we've been doing this for you know x amount of years now so you better stop yeah it, it's almost as if slingerland wasn't really paying much attention to what the other companies were doing they yeah they were just you know steal they're basically a, a quote unquote borrowing concepts from other companies now let me ask you this before i forget so there was, I, I remember reading in the book, I think briefly in the Slingerland book, about Slingerland owning their own farm, and they would raise cows to have, um, for the, obviously their calfskin heads. Do you know anything about that? Only from what I had read in Rob Cook's uh, Slingerland book. Yeah. I don't have too much information on, on, on that. Okay. And... I'll look into that, because it's just, and I think I remember reading that they had like at one point, like the world's largest cow, I think its name was Greta or something. <laughs> so, yeah, that does sound familiar. <laughs> okay, we'll just plant that in people's ears so they can think, uh, you know, think about Slingerland's giant cow. There you go. Uh, there was a company called Amrocco, American Rawhide Company. Uh, there was also in Chicago, I think, I'm pretty sure. And a lot of the companies were getting their heads through that. Uh, uh, the drunk companies were getting their heads from Amrocco. Okay. That's that's one of those little pieces where you think because uh, I know a lot of the companies they'll say they were drying out hides on the roof and they were doing this and that so um, but I'm sure times changed and uh, and all that kind of stuff so, sure yeah okay so Radio King in '35 we are introduced to that um, some hardware updates um, things are getting more modern 
in this period, right? They're they're pushing the the. Uh, I like how you see on the broadcaster on the actual rim it says Slingerland Broadcaster, which is such a cool touch. Yeah, it really is, and it was that was hand engraved too. It, it wasn't stamped into the into the rim. Wow! So that was somebody somebody on an assembly line, uh, you know, doing that by hand. And even the the first Radio Kings had hand engraved hoops. Uh, uh, like that, and th- that didn't last too long because w- once their sales took off, it just wasn't practical. So they were stamping the uh, design into the into the hoop uh, as opposed to hand engraving. Wow. Okay. And they had Radio Kings are full kits. They're a lot of people. A lot of times you see them, and it's just the snare drum, but they are full drum sets of Radio Kings. Yeah, they attach that name to everything. Um, oh. And yeah, for years people would say, "Oh, it's not a true Radio King if it's not this or it's not that." Uh, that's really not true. It just they would. I mean, they had practice pads that said Slingerland Radio King on them. That's interesting. It's kind of a uh, just a branding a branding ploy. Because I honestly, when I was first looking into this, you kind of you see Radio King and 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 you wonder what exactly that that is. That what makes it that special thing a Radio King? But it, it kind of just makes sense that it's like anything today. It's like a it's like a series of drums. Now they were making Radio Kings. Yes. Were they making other lines of drums? Like did they have a lower tier entry level kit um, at this time as well? Uh, they did, but uh, still they would even their student model snare drum is called a student model Radio King, and I mean they did that for years. And even though it's it's not a solid maple shell or it just was a branding thing, like you said. That's uh, that's interesting and and uh, it's cool. I'm looking on your website here and I see they were making um, they were also making the like they've got the Pax All Trap Console with wheels, which would be their their kind of all in one uh, trap drummer setup. Yeah, those uh, all the companies uh, back then were using were offering those uh, rolling trap tables, and uh, I, I have I've had a couple here. I have one still and. From what I understand, they they were being imported from Europe, from hmm. England, and like Premier was big on these wow. elaborate, these big elaborate things that they could wheel out with the the bass drum, and the whole set was on this thing and had a, a trap table and everything attached to it. And you just wheel it out on stage. Just to visualize it, it is literally basically bass drum, snare, two toms connected to almost what would be like a rack right now with wheels um a chinese tom tom and then you've got your temple blocks and just a gong and then i'm sure on the table yeah. you'd put all your little like your uh your rattle and all of your little noisemakers um which would accompany exactly. theater shows silent films um which obviously if this is around the uh you know 20s 30s it's 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 not long for this world um no not at all it was it and I think that may have come from like the vaud. It was basically the vaudeville era. Yeah, they were using those. Yeah. Wow. All right. So then we are approaching the '40s, um, which, as we all know, and uh, in the previous episode we've talked about uh, on episode two, we talked about the World War II stuff. Uh, Slingerland is pretty, pretty much synonymous with. If you think of World War II era drums, you typically think of the Rolling Bomber. Um, which uh, over like the Ludwig victory and all, or the victorious and all this stuff. Um, so they were they were big in, in the World War II era. They were, and they were the only company that had top and bottom tunable heads uh, during World War II. All the other companies had it uh, just went back to basics and had uh, tapped on bottom heads. Interesting. So they were really primitive, and, and that's why the the Rolling Bombers were more successful, I guess, and more in demand today, hmm. as opposed to the other companies. They're more playable, uh, and they're just works of art, too. Absolutely. So top and bottom heads could be tuned, but no floor tom legs, because that came post-World War II. Well, uh, there's, now there's, some, there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. Uh, the, World War II may have been uh, the jumping-off point for them starting to put legs on, because they, the, the Rolling Bomber floor toms, uh, actually had wooden legs on them. They had these wooden, wooden bra- three wooden brackets on the on the drum, with a hole drilled in it, and then you would have this thick, maybe inch and a half, t- piece of wood like a dowel, you know, dowel rod, and it would fit in to the hole. And 
they weren't very reliable at all, and they, they would fall out. Yeah, but that sure. was that was their first excursion into floor tom lakes. Hmm. So I guess that you know, so they were starting to catch on by by World War Two. Yeah, as as things are just completely changing. Um, now were they um, were they still? So we're in this kind of early forties, late thirties, early forties. Were they still making um, banjos at this point in time? I don't think so. I, I'm I'm not. I would have to check on that when they actually stopped offering banjos. I would think once they became the Slinger and Drum Company and dropped that banjo name, which I guess was around 1936. Okay. 36, 37, when their first catalog came out for Radio King. Cool. And yeah, the banjo, banjos were pretty much a thing of the past, especially, you know, they're getting into swing bands and the banjo didn't play a real big part in those from what I can tell. Yeah. If you're obviously doing the best with drums, why, why keep making something else yes. that doesn't seem to be? And, exactly. and I, I think I heard in one of the previous interviews that the the hype and the obsession with banjos kind of dissipated a little bit and wasn't quite as massive as it was uh, in the 20s. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Okay. So now uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who want to hear a little bit more about like hardware, such as lugs and the stick saver rims and all that stuff. What was going on in uh, in this period of time there? Were they changing their lugs a lot, or has it been pretty much consistent through the whole uh, history of the company? Uh, well, starting with the broadcaster in 1935, up until 1940, they were, they were using what was known as a streamline lug. It's the it's the one everyone is, rec- uh, is familiar with on Radio King drums. In 1940, they came out with something called a beaver tail lug on, on their uh, Super Radio King line. And they were small uh, lugs made out of cast metal, just like the streamline lugs were. But it was just a, a distinctive look. There was really no reason for them that I could. Uh, maybe they were a little bit lighter weight, so it would it would, might make a, a drum set weigh a little bit less. But uh, they became pretty popular. The, the beaver tail. And they were they were available at the same time as the streamline lugs. So that was it was an optional thing. Cool. Those little beaver tail lugs. Uh, Actually, you could order tom toms and bass drums with them, and the only one, only bass drum I've ever seen with with small beaver tails was one I had a few years ago, and it's really kind of unusual looking, but it did make the drum a lot lighter. Yeah, I bet so that could have been been a reason for it. Uh, and they were available up until about 1955. Now, like what you just said there, with this drum has uh, th- this is the only bass drum you've seen with the beaver tail. Were they pretty consistent? With like, uh, I, I from what I hear in all these drum companies, it's almost like I've come across a couple that have this and a couple that have that. Um, it seems like as times change, they just kind of put whatever they had uh, for various drums. Um, it wasn't as much of a um, this is this goes with this drum, this goes with this drum. They seem to have a little bit more uh, discrepancies in in uh, what was going on. Uh, yeah, the, you see that a lot with Slingerland, uh, more so than any other company that they were. Uh, mixing and matching parts, and, and especially tra- as they transition from one uh, era to another, uh, you see some unusual combinations of hardware. Cool. So, side note here, just to kind of keep the timeline going with who's running the company. So, HH uh, founded the company, HH Slingerland. He is in charge um, up in th- up until in the 30s. Then I believe he died of a stroke, and then Henry Jr., also known as Bud, took over. And I think that's yeah. kind of our current owner at the point where we're at. Yeah, and uh, he was the owner up until uh, until the 60s. I don't, I don't know the exact date, but he, yeah, he, was, the, he was the main man cool. uh, all, through the, all through the 50s and, and 60s. Yeah, Bud with two Ds is uh, whenever you hear about Slingerland, you typically... You hear about Bud, yeah, big big personality, right? And there was also there, there was also uh, Walter Robert Slingerland was uh, HH's brother, I believe. Okay, and uh, he was he was heavily involved in the company early on too. Well, the family nature of the company was obviously uh, super prevalent until later on when it gets when it gets sold off. But um, yes, but we will get there. So um, all right, we we get out of World War II. Now, do you know any uh, any cool, in- interesting kind of secret tidbits about was Slingerland making anything in particular during the war effort besides drums? I don't think they were. I know okay. the other companies uh, like Ludwig and Ludwig. I think they were making. 
altimeters yeah. uh, for, for airplanes and, and different different things. Uh, I don't think Slingerland really, they kind of just, aside from the rolling bombers, uh, they kind of just backed away. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the government in June of 1942, they issued their uh, declaration or their order that you could, companies had to use only 10% metal in in producing their instruments. Yeah, the uh, and, the L thirty seven ruling. Yeah, that's that's it. Yep. Yes, L thirty seven, and that was in place until uh, nineteen forty four. Uh, I think I think middle of nineteen forty four. They re- they started to relax. You know, as as the Allies were winning the war and the tides were turning, uh, they started to relax the restrictions. But it was still a tough time, and it took the companies a couple of years to get back on their feet. Crucial metals were still not available until like nineteen forty six. Such you know because brass was a huge part of the of the war effort. Yeah. So they just they had to they had to make do with what they had. Uh, I have a letter from the company uh, that was sent out to the dealers saying that symbols weren't available. Uh, if you ordered a Radio King set, it would it, they would all have except for the snare drums. Everything had to have wooden hoops. Wow. Uh, because there just there was such a scarcity of uh, raw materials. Now, do you find those? Have you seen some of those the the war era Radio Kings that have the the wooden hoops do those come up yes yeah as a matter of fact there's there's a uh, uh a white marine pearl set on my on the website on the slingerland history website that's a good example of that with pearl inlay on the hoops yeah well i'm looking at it right now it's unbelievable and, and again you asked about the uh the uh rolling bombers because they they had the uh, ability to tune top and bottom heads they were quite playable and as a matter of fact i i used them at gigs over the years and uh they were great with the exception of the snare drum, I, in the middle of the song, I broke two lugs on it. <laughs> oh God! On the snare, on the snare drum, yeah, because you just could, you know, they won't take much tension. I mean, you need a lot more tension on the snare, obviously, than yeah, than a bass drum or a tom tom. So, the, the bass and toms were great, but uh, wow, the, the the snare drums were a little dicey. Yeah, I mean, but you know, people be using brushes; it would be less loud, kind of like plain not saying that you were playing yeah. death metal on a rolling bomber or something but um <laughs> yeah that's uh that's good to know though you know i'm sure they're extremely well made and uh they're just beautiful drums oh they really are they're like i said they're works of art that, with the rosewood uh they, they used rosewood and walnut just you know whatever was available at the time but they the result was a very beautiful set yeah so we get out of world war ii um <laughs> and they're allowed to use metal again. Everything's great. People are playing the drums. So now we're kind of in the late 40s and the 50s. The, well, the, you know, the drums really didn't change much from pre-war to post-war. Uh, they basically were the same product, and they very little change uh, until you get into, you know, 1947, they started installing floor tom legs, which is a big change. And in, in 1948, they redesigned uh, all of their lugs in the style of the the small beaver tails. They made they just made them large, and so the bass drums and the tom toms would be uh, put together with these new 1948 lugs with the, the curved end as opposed to the squared off streamlines. And uh, with the exception of the snare drum, they kept the streamline look all the way up until 1955. Hmm. Wow. And hardware, they seem to be kind of uh, pushing forward with with uh, innovative hardware. They've obviously, they're making their own... I, I, I assume that a lot of their hardware, like the other companies, uh, stands and, and they were produced by uh, se- a separate company, like Wahlberg and OJ. Yeah, okay. The big, ma- big maker of... So, I mean, they would. Ma- I think a lot of this stuff was, was made for them by, by machine companies. Interesting. I didn't know that. That's uh, good information because you never know who's making what and what's generic and who's got the same thing going on. It would just make sense that they wouldn't have the, the ability on site to be producing all these uh, metal stands. I mean, I could be wrong about this, uh, it's, but uh, it seems to me that they were shot. They were outsourcing um, some of these parts. Sure. Versus fabricating all your own metal and all that stuff. Um, yeah, even the lugs, I'm pretty sure, were made by a, a machine, a separate machine company. Wow, cool. Okay, so and then just to clarify, I'm looking on your website here. It says uh, in 1954, Slingerland president Robert Slingerland uh, retired, and H.H. H. 
Slingerland Jr. or Bud replaced him. So I think I had my uh, my times wrong before. So um, Walter took over after HH, and then Bud followed Walter. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Glad I could clear that up and not look like a uh, complete idiot. So, um, well, I was going along, I was going along with you there for a little bit. So I'm I'm an idiot. too. (laughs) (laughs) We're in this together. All right. So fifties, Bud's running the show. Um, it's good. It's good to note that in 1955, they they did a complete overhaul of the, of the looks of their drums, the hardware, everything changed. Uh, they went with what was called the sound King hardware Hmm. and, uh, they did away with the sharp, which some people call stick chopper, who yeah. they did away with those in favor of a, a more rounded edge, a uh, more rounded edge to the top, or to the to the hoops in general. People call them stick saver. I don't even think that was a, an official name, but uh, and they went from they got rid of it. They did away with the streamlined, you know, squared off cigar shaped lugs in favor of the of what everyone's familiar with nowadays, uh, the uh, very rounded, uh, smooth edge. Yeah. Sound King lugs. Hmm, wow! Uh, they they kept the same. The strainers were were kept modified slightly, uh, but both the clamshell and the the uh, nine sixty seven, uh, known as the three point strainer, they they kept with those for a long time. You know, if it worked, why mess with it? Exactly. Don't fix what's uh, what's not broken. Mm, not broken. Yeah. So they um, nineteen fifty five. They purchase the Leedy Drum Company from Con. Uh, yeah, Khan decided to drop their drum line, so uh, Slingerland and Ludwig both were bidding on on the drum making uh, equipment, and Leedy got some, and Slingerland got some. I'm sorry, Ludwig Ludwig got some, and Slingerland got some, and they it was kind of a confusing time. Yeah, uh, you've got what they call Slinger Leedy, huh. where they had they had a Leedy name on it, but it was basically a Slingerland uh, drum. And that that didn't last too, that didn't last too long. Yeah, um, Leedy in general um, is just kind of a, an interesting company that that was so big and so massive, and then kind of got passed around and uh, and just just fizzled out, which is just kind of sad. Yeah, and when Ludwig acquired certain things from from uh, the sale of Leedy, they 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 introduced the Leedy and Ludwig. Yeah. Uh, company which is a whole different story <laughs> yeah that's its own whole thing but slingerland persists i kind of always ask what was the the golden era um w- of of a drum company um what would you say is slingerland's golden golden age well to, to me I, I just i love the early 30s era it's just a, kind of a magical era for me and, and especially because the the fancy finishes were so much more in vogue uh, during that time, once the late thirties hit, they started doing away with, uh, most of the fancy finishes and it was basically sparkle finishes, mm-hmm. white marine pearl, black, black diamond pearl, and, you know, things like sea green and coral and abalone, all those kind of gorgeous exotic finishes were a thing of the past. So I, to me, that's the golden era. Others would say the the radio King era, you know, hmm. uh, and some would say the sixties the is just, you know, yeah. It varies from one person to another, but uh, to me, yeah, the, the uh, 1930s, early 30s, late 20s, early 30s is my favorite golden age. <laughs> cool. Yeah, out of they all have many. I think that's kind of a uh, subjective uh, subjective question there. All right, so in when we get in the 60s, I think most people know that in the 60s when the madness with the Beatles happen, a lot of people decide to pick up drums, and I'm sure there was an upswing for all companies, I, I, I bet Slingerland wasn't uh, excluded from that. Obviously, Ringo was playing Ludwig, but I think there was kind of a uh, a trickle effect for a lot of people of of just uh, creating the boom of of becoming drummers. Sure, I mean the the, the introduction the introduction of rock and roll. Yeah, uh, that was a boost for for every company. Uh, obviously, Ludwig uh, benefited the most with the with the uh, the Ringo Association. Yeah. And and Slingerland, to a point, was looked on looked upon at that time as a little bit old fashioned. I think still having Gene Krupa as their main endorser. Yeah, uh, it was you know it's sort of it's sort of a you know a throwback to the big band era, and not hip, not with it, not modern. So I, I would I, without actually knowing, I, I would assume that their sales lagged 
uh, in comparison to Ludwig, definitely. Now, um, but so yes, Krupa, more old school. Obviously, um, Buddy Rich was a Slingerland player, a lot less uh, loyal, particularly just to one company. Um, yeah, yeah, Buddy would play anything <laughs> pretty much if you paid him. Yeah, but he he did play a lot of uh, Slingerland, obviously, and I'm sure that yes. that was a big draw um, in that era for people. So that's that's important to note. Yeah, he started out on Slingerland uh, when he was you know a young drummer. Uh, he was a, he was an endorser in the you know in the late 30s, and he switched to Ludwig at one point or WFL, and then Rogers in the in the mid 60s, and then back to I think he stayed pretty much as Sling once he went back to Slingerland after. Uh, after the Rogers era, I think he stayed with Slingerland for the for the rest of his life. Even at the end of his career, he he had a, a an old fashioned Radio King set put together in his final days, uh, sort of as a nostalgia thing, I guess. Hmm. Cool. So um, one thing to note, and uh, people have probably seen it, is the uh, um, the yellow tiger pearl finish, where it's basically the tiger stripe. Um, that is by far my favorite drum set i i've seen them more as uh uh stewards in the japanese world you see them in that finish um and various other companies but gosh that is just such a neat drum and finish um i recommend people look up yellow tiger pearl and you are going to love it well they were the only company that actually made that finish uh and i agree it's my face it's my favorite They, they had a red tiger uh version at the same time not as to me, not as exciting as the yellow, uh, and definitely yeah, yeah. the yellow is more is more uncommon. And I think you know, just to touch upon the the MIJ uh, thing, because the the Japanese companies were using inferior, uh, for the most part, using inferior uh, quality parts and shells. They went with the fanciest finishes. I mean, some of their Japanese finishes are crazy, yeah. and I think it was just to comp to compensate for the lack of maybe lack of construction quality, they slapped on some really wild finishes to kind of, you know, up their profile. Don't look at our crappy hardware, but look at the, uh, yes. <laughs> look at this crazy finish. <laughs> sort of a diversion. Yeah. A diversionary tactic. Yeah. Look well, over here. Well, it worked. Cause I, I love the MIJ stuff and a lot of people do. So that's, and, and that, oh, yeah. I think those are making, they've, they've, they've not gone away, but I think a lot of people are realizing, wow, I can get a great drum set for 400 bucks that looks yes. a lot like a Slingerland set, or it looks a lot like a Gretsch set, but it's dirt cheap compared to what you would pay for these, uh, the real deal stuff. It's, am- it's amazing how they got away with, with the close copying they did of hardware. I mean, they even made a, a radio King looking drum with a three point strainer, <laughs> wow. all, all Japanese parts. And looks like the real deal from a, a foot or two away, but uh, it's amazing they were able to do that. I guess you couldn't really co- go after a company, ac- you know, across the Pacific, well, to to say, hey, you can't do this. No, and that's exactly from uh, when I talked to Mark Patch about it. That's what he said. Is it seemed like, um, and I think uh, Jim Moritz said the same thing. Where he said, it's not worth it. Yeah, you, you're going to sue yeah. a company in China that you. I mean, how right. how do you litigate that? It's. Uh, it's just not worth it. But I bet it did. I mean, I'm sure it did make some sort of a dent in uh, the sales at Slingerland because half the people would say, you know what, we're not sure if you're actually going to play this instrument, little son or daughter. So here, let's start with this. And uh, Yes. Did. And it looks, you know, it, for all intent and purposes, it looks like a, 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 a top quality Slingerland, Slingerland uh, drum set. <laughs> yeah. Basically the same with finish. Yeah, yeah, at a fraction of the price, and but it's yeah, I, like you said, it was to to litigate that across the sea would be just wouldn't be worthwhile. No. All right, so then in 1970, um, Bud decides to retire, and um, he sells the company. So after 42 years of family ownership, um, the company is in different hands, uh, which is pretty sad. But I'm sure that uh, that is honestly the way it goes with a lot of these companies. Right. It was it was sold to a publishing firm, and that's about the only information I have. Uh, but fortunately and thankfully, they, they didn't change anything, and they continued to make uh, really high-quality uh, Slingerland drums. I guess the, the, the owners, the new owners, figured, why change it? Why mess with a good thing? 
and it, they continued into the into the early eighties, uh, basically looking looking and the same as ever, and you know some changes in the shell design, but they kept a lot of the 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 look and feel of the Slingerland drums all the way up until into the eighties and mid eighties, and uh, when Gretsch and Gibson and some other companies passed, you know, passed ownership from one to the other. Yeah. It just kind of gets handed down. Um, and then you've, you see pictures, uh, I think it's the, um, gosh, I forget the name of it. The kind of like, it's like the Trey cool model, like uh nineties kind of like beginner drum set where it's kind of, you, it just appears that it's the logo slapped onto a, um, like a Chinese, um, Yes, and that's when it really uh, quality went downhill uh, during that time, and it just it no longer, to me, bore any resemblance to uh, what I what I, what I would think of when I would say think of Slingerland. It just no. uh, it just they cheapened cheapened the name. Yeah, yeah. So not nothing like the old stuff, um, but uh, so that basically brings us to the modern day, where as far as I understand. Um, I'm pretty sure to this day Gibson owns the trademark, um, and nothing is happening with it. I, I don't think there's yeah, any plan it, to to do anything else. It doesn't seem like it. it seems like they're just sitting on the name, and uh, for what to what end or for what reason I have no idea. It, but it, I, from what I understand, there's no plans uh, for it, for the company to be revived. Well, I, I see that as let it let it. Let it be what it was. Let it um, be the great company that everyone loves. That's just absolutely a part of drum history. Um, up and down, it's just nothing but um, great stuff. Uh, and I, I think yeah. it's just it's super cool. And and your website and you as a just a, a person is such a great resource. Um, Man, this has been amazing. Um, why don't you tell people where they can find you, what's going on, if there's anything you're working on, um, email, anything. Just let people know where they can find you. Well, the best way to reach me is through my website at www.coopersvintagedrums.com. And I've got, I have several Facebook pages, uh, one devoted to Slingerland history, uh, Leedy, uh, uh, World War II drums. I've, I've got a lot of... Uh, I'm in a lot of places. So yeah, I'm pretty easy. To, I'm pretty easy to find. Cool. Well, you're a super nice guy, and it's been uh, it's been great talking with you. I know everyone's going to love hearing this and uh, and getting to the bottom of Slingerland because it's not a modern company that you see out and about all the time. So it's kind of a um, it's really I think special to to learn about this kind of stuff that that made us the drummers we are today. Oh, I'm so happy to be a part of it. And and what really thrills me is is I, I'm seeing a lot of young guys getting into the vintage drums and it's, you know, because for years we all collect us collectors would talk about, Oh, the next generation is not going to have any interest in this stuff. And, you know, they're not going to want to hear, know about or hear about, you know, drums from the thirties or the forties. And it's proving not to be the case. I, I run into a lot of young people that are crazy for the vintage drums. So that's, that's a encouraging, uh, encouraging thing. Yeah. It's just, uh, you, you can't be a drummer and not be drawn to these amazing historical, uh, drums and facts and information. So, um, yeah. And the, the obsession never goes away. I'm 61 years old and I've been, I've been uh, crazy about vintage drums since I was uh, 24 or 23, 24. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> when very few people were into it back then. That's funny. It's, it's incurable. Oh, and it was so hard to find information on vintage drums back then. I mean, you didn't have the way, obviously you didn't have the internet. There were only a couple people that I knew that knew anything about it. So it was, it was kind of a frustrating era to learn about vintage drums, but uh, it's really changed. And, and you can find uh, information on any of this stuff at the touch of a, at the touch of a keystroke. Yeah, and that all comes back to where people should go, which is uh, coopersvintagedrums.com incredible resource. Um, I've shared your photos on Instagram and stuff and, uh, it's just amazing. So, um, I'm going to have to send you a cease and desist order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to come up with a website that has the exact same name. Uh, there you go. Spelled only, only spell it with a K Cooper with yeah. a K Cooper's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. All right, Mark. Uh, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today and uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll see you around at the drum shows. Thank you so much, Bart. And I'll be at the Chicago Drum Show this year. Cool. In May. I'll be there. All right, Mark. Talk to you Thank later. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 
If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.